Bienvenidos al podcast Expert Talks. Queridos amigos, soy Leo Jiménez y aprovecho mi rol de CEO en go for click para invitar a expertos en formación de reconocidas empresas a compartir sus experiencias y buenas prácticas. En cada episodio podrás encontrar entrevistas breves y al grano para descubrir tips que te inspiren a innovar y a desarrollar mejores propuestas para tus usuarios. Welcome to another week of the Expert Talk podcast. This is Leo Jiménez and I use my role as CEO at go for click to invite training experts from large company to share their experiences and good practice to inspire others to innovate. Expert Talks is the podcast that I would have liked to listen to when I was a training director, reference people, short interview and practical tips to allow you to capitalize on the experience. Today, we are going to talk with Dr. Philippa Hartman, founder in DOMS and XBP Learning in Aula, a great influence on go for click Welcome, Philippa, and thank you for being here. So, who are you and what does DOM mean? Yeah, hey Leo, um, thanks for having me. This is a, a great pleasure. So yeah, um, I'm, uh, I'm Phil. I'm, uh, as, as you said, the founder of, of DOMS. DOMS is, um, put very simply, like an evidence-based process for designing courses of any kind. Um, it's um, some people refer to it as like Addy with a PhD. Uh, I think most of your listeners will know what Addy is, but essentially it is a series of um, steps based on my experience. So I've been designing learning experiences now as an academic and uh, as a learning designer. And as you said, as like a VP learning a, a couple of um, organizations as well. Um, so I've been doing this for a long time. And so what I've done is I've kind of accumulated all of my experience and my research and I've put together this uh um, I guess a sort of upgrade um, on Addy in that it is a both a series of steps. So it says what to do when, as Addy does. Um, uh, but it also says how to do it. Because for me, as an emerging learning designer, like that was a big problem that I hit. It's like, great, okay. So I need to analyze some stuff and then design some stuff and then deliver some stuff. But like, how do I make those decisions? Like, what does analysis mean? What does design mean? And then when I dug deeper into this, uh, this problem, I found that it was common across loads of different learning designers, teachers, educators in, in higher ed, um, you name it. People were like, yeah, like I would love, like it feels a bit like a finger in the wind exercise, like a bit of a guessing game. Um, and so, yeah, DOMS is all about trying to solve that problem by providing a, 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 a simple structure and a, and a simplified way of making evidence-based decisions about how to design a learning experience. Nice. Thank you for introduct your introduction. And what is the training challenge you want to share with us? Yeah, so I think um, I would like actually to go back to my uh, Aula days here, which is where we, uh, we first met, I know. And um, yeah, we were given a challenge there, which actually was like the most beautiful, wicked challenge that, um, that I, I, like one of the most beautiful and wicked challenges that I've ever had to face. So we worked with um, Coventry University in the UK, uh, really well known for its innovation. And they basically uh, set us the challenge of um, redesigning 1,200 degree level modules uh in three months so 1200 modules 12 weeks um and it was like okay how do we do this um and so the challenge was uh partly practical it's like how on earth do we if we keep in mind that like it takes on it takes on average i think it's uh six months to design a 12-week course so how on earth are we going to reduce that to so we were designing 12-week courses how are we going to reduce um, six months to, you know, <laughs> more like not even six days, more like six hours. Uh, and so the problem was partly the challenge was partly uh, practical. Like how what's the machine that's going <laughs> to going to be able to produce this stuff at this rate? But it was also uh, about quality and pedagogy because Coventry University, of course, are uh, pushing all of the time to deliver the best possible experience for their students and the best possible outcomes for their students. And so there was like a two pronged or two parts to the challenge. One, practical, 
like you just have to get this stuff out what's the what's the process and then second uh this pedagogical challenge around like is there anything that we could do to transform what are currently lecture-based approaches so traditional chalk and talk sage on the stage uh kind of expert-led and content driven experiences is there anything that we can do in this process to actually change that up a little bit in order to improve some key uh um sort of um targets which are quite common i think both in higher education and more broadly like workplace lnd so things like uh learner retention uh learner motivation um learner satisfaction and of course like evidence of impact so their grades um, as well as things like their well-being satisfaction so so yeah we had a challenge that was both practical and pedagogical um and yeah it was uh it was interesting um I mean we learned we had to act very rapidly we basically had to like my vision was to try and build a machine that operated in a way similar to uh product development and so it was like right okay the first thing we need to understand is like what is it that these learners are trying to learn who are they what will motivate them all those things and so we developed a very rapid uh, means of doing some discovery to make sure that all of these designs were uh, learner centered um and then we then i then uh, developed a uh, a process by which our learning designers by this point we had a team of learning designers i think it was the biggest in the world of over i think it was around about 150 at its biggest these brilliant learning designers on the ground, given this challenge to work with educators to design things. Um, so how do we enable them to make very uh, rapid, but very um, robust decisions? Um, so yeah, it was up to me to, and, and the team, of course, we all worked together to develop a, uh, a series of steps and some pedagogic, some evidence-based principles that enabled us to work with very, very efficiently with educators um to get to a design and one thing that did like one impact and one result of this challenge is that we were able to significantly reduce like the time to design so one of our biggest achievements i think was design efficiency so we did deliver 1200 modules in three months uh, I think in, in the end, our average um, time to design, so that's like a robust, agreed with an educator design on paper. Um, the average time scale for that, I think, in the end was I th three to four days um, with with not a, a significant amount of input from the, the educator. So we just identified in this process exactly when we need to talk to them and what we need to know. So we were able to make it super tight. Um, and yeah, we, we um, as I say, we, I set a number of principles for making decisions based on variables like who the learners are, what what's their starting point, what's the topic and what does the research tell us about how to teach this topic? And then how do we turn all of this, what, what usually was like a pile of lectures into something that was m more active um, and more problem-based for the, for the learners? And so, yeah, the result was a we learned a lot about how to make learning design incredibly efficient so taking that six month time to design and reducing it to three to four days and then we also have since found and there is a detailed case study of this by the way on the Aula website so please dig in if you want more detail but um, the other big success was that we did uh, have a positive impact on those outcomes that we were trying to hit so um, we saw a 25 percent increase compared with the before version of the modules um, in um, student satisfaction. So the students loved the designs that we produced. Um, we also saw, I think um, Coventry had its highest ever um, proportion of perfect educator scores. So the students were really happy with the interactions that they were having with the, with the educators in this new, more active and problem-based kind of approach. The educators also um, showed a product market fit in that I think in the end it was like 95 96 percent of the educators said that they would do this again so they liked the process and then since then um, you know our, the data shows that, that we also had a, an impact on maybe the things that matter most um, so things like learner retention increased uh, learner motivation increased uh, and learner scores increased so yeah that was like a wild you can imagine it was a wild process and it was uh, we learned a lot along the way 
I think maybe one key lesson, one key takeaway that I would love to share with people is uh, like we made lots of mistakes along the way. Of course, this was something totally unprecedented. I think the main lesson learned is that at first we made the assumption that educators we know are very time poor. So the subject matter experts just don't have time for this. It's like item number 300 on a long list of things they already have to do. So what we we made the assumption based on that data that, oh, well, they would love it if we just designed them a thing. We take their material, design it, and then throw a redesign at them. They will love it. In fact, what we found is that they didn't love it because they weren't involved in it, because they didn't feel ownership of it, because it felt like we just thrown something over a wall at them. And so regardless of the quality of that output, we learned that it wasn't optimal to uh, exclude educators, to exclude subject matter experts from the process. So we quickly iterated and we changed the process so that it became more of a co-creation process. And as I said before, it was very lean, but we brought the um, educators in, we, we, we got access to their content, we brought them in to explore like to, and to validate the design decisions that we were making. And what we found is that's where we found success. So there is something about lean collaboration that got us to a better result. Um, working solo without the subject matter expert got us to a great result faster, but it wasn't adopted. And so this, there is something here about an adoption challenge, a, uh, a change management issue um, that, that we managed to resolve as well. So I think big lessons learned in summary. One, we can speed up the learning design process significantly and at the same time to get better results. So get a better learning experience, which is more pedagogically robust, as in um, kind of follows the rules of learning science, the things we know about how humans learn. Um, and yes, also that the, it is possible to uh, bring stakeholders along that journey with you um, without having to pay in time, uh, without having it to take, without it having to take uh, six months. So yeah, that was incredibly exciting and a brilliant experience and really what informed then what I'm working on now, which is this DOMS process. I've since like researched it further, distilled it further. And then, yeah, here we are. Really interesting, your, your challenge, your approach to innovate in this field. Uh, and you really looks like you love your job. Philippa. <laughs> um, okay. But yeah, I do. You can tell, yeah, can't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, one more uh, question is a kind of bonus track. Is uh, a, a, quit, a, a quite different, I think, of your approach. So what, what the data evidence tell us about social learning or mm -hmm. collaborative learning or uh, community-based learning experiences? Hmm. No, it's a great question. And actually, Aula, that was our, our driving question, really. We had this hypothesis that uh, a learning experience is better if it somehow uh, involves um, connection with others. Um, I think one a few things on this, though, that spring to mind that we found challenging at first uh, is that we talk a lot about social learning, about collaborative learning, but that there isn't a definitive uh, or agree definition of what that means. And so um, like a social learning experience is 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 sometimes a uh, a long recorded uh, like a MOOC with a discussion on the end. Uh, sometimes that's referred to as a social learning experience all the way through to something which is um, you know more kind of cohort based intensive team based working together. And so uh, I think one lesson learned is that sometimes we need to be more specific in our language when we're talking about social learning, that actually we're referring to much more specific uh, instructional strategies that sit underneath it and that they're the things that lead to success or not. So basically, if you just like, and I know that everybody knows this, but the difference is that like, if you just tag a discussion onto a lecture, that's not that could be described as social because there's some connection, but it's not necessarily going to have value because the, the, the pedagogical approach isn't optimized. Um, whereas if you have a cohort based course, which has um, 
or, or more of a or take more of a peer instruction kind of Eric Mazur type approach. And uh, there's a great podcast by Eric Mazur, which we can maybe link to from this, where the social learning is much more intentional, where we work together to solve problems, to compare our outputs, to hold one another to account, to motivate one another. Um, then social learning becomes very powerful. So I think like one thing we know for sure is that um, disembodied, disconnected learning doesn't work. Um, it's, you know, one of the, the great tragedies, really, the great disappointments of the MOOC is that it increased access to uh, very high quality learning experiences, but they did remain largely uh, disembodied. I think there was some, there was some success, more success with the C MOOC, the connected MOOC, which helps to kind of uh, verify that the, the connection matters. So when when MOOCs uh, were designed to, for example, have so I designed a MOOC uh, for the University of Oxford, their first MOOC, I mean, and it was a C MOOC in that we um, it was a typical MOOC in that there was like content and there was some activity, but at the end we had a live session with the professor uh, who celebrated some of the outputs that some of the learners, there was basically connection both between learners and between learners and the professor at scale. And that made a huge difference. So there is value in connection because there is something up there about um, intrinsic motivation. So I would say the value of, of, of the social connected approach actually lies in um, yeah, intrinsic motivation in having accountability, in having clarity of what it is I want to, I'm, I need to do, but also knowing that there is going to be value for me in that I can build a network, learn from others and this kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, as I was saying, like disembodied learning doesn't work. Um, I think in, in a nutshell, I think, I, you know, when people ask me, Phil, like, in a tweet, how do humans learn? I always say that it is a combination, and this is what the evidence says. So I summarize the evidence by saying, uh, learning happens through a combination of experience and dialogue. And that without that dialogue, the experience lacks context, lacks meaning, and potentially uh, lacks like reliable understanding and meaning. And so I think in that sense, uh, social connected learning, community-based learning is absolutely essential. Without the ability to engage in dialogue, we lose the ability to learn, I would say. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I have a, a, an additional question around mm -hmm. this topic. Are the creator interesting, really interesting in working in that way? Because I think it's a little harder to design this kind of um, experiences, right? It's much better or, or it's more simple. Uh, just talk in front of people, right? Yeah. Are, mm -hmm. are the creator interesting in that, uh, I don't know, time consumer process? Yeah, yeah. It's a great question and you're right. Like, I think one of the reasons that this uh chalk and talk uh pedagogy is so pervasive and really has ever refused to go away despite the fact that we know that there are better ways and despite the fact that we have technologies that will enable different ways um is that the reason it stays around a good um you know, three to five years, and this is how it works. So the so the system isn't really broken for educators uh, if their task is is to teach. If, however, they want their students to learn, they need to have uh, more of an appetite. And, and you fi I find it's varied. And so even within higher education, there are some educators who are absolutely committed to, for example, like the lecture-based model. Um, and in other places there are um educators often in the same institution but there are other educators who are more interested in and accountable for like the impact that they have on their students and in those cases yes there is appetite to do the work and i think we saw that at coventry you know that we, we worked with um a thousand educators all of whom 
were up for rethinking the lecture to a different extent, we should say. Like some people just added a small amount of active uh, social um, strategy into their lectures. Some people went a whole hog and did like a purple owler version, which is what we used to call them, but like an extreme version. That And so there is some choice within within this. It's not binary. It's not black and white. Um, and but I think what's interesting and, and um Definitely within like L and D in the workplace, there is appetite to have an impact because that's kind of why we're spending the money on this thing. So the appetite there, I would say, is <clears throat> excuse me, overall greater than in formal education, where there is less, uh, I guess, less of a, a financial impetus. But what has been interesting is, um, so in I think it was in December last year, late last year anyway, um, a professor was fired from New York University for not serving their students well enough and that's the first example of an educator who was held accountable to the fact that they didn't want to change they didn't want to make their teaching better so that learning actually happens and they were held accountable for that and so I think more and more yes people are open to this uh, alternative way which might be more challenging um, but ultimately gets better results and I would say because we've been talking now for uh what like I don't know maybe 20 25 minutes and we've not mentioned it yet somehow but AI uh, is going to also change this I think AI will take away some of the pain uh, of, um, of, of of that transition to a new way of teaching and learning um, so already you know playing with attempting to automate elements of DOM so that it's easier to apply the science of learning to the art of learning design um, and I think also we will get some additional support um, in time, we will build AI tutors that can give us additional support to be able to be more of a coach than a lecturer. So I think we're only going to move more and more towards this social and collaborative approach. We have hope. So <laughs> um, the the last one is um, uh, is associated with the last part of you said. Um, how many years are left to change the way of we teach? Well, how long is it going to take? Yeah. Well, well, it depends. I mean, again, uh, it's already happening. There are uh, places where there are innovation happening right now. I know that there's, uh, you know, across the world, there are educators who are um, taking a more active problem-based and social approach to design and delivery in higher ed. I think in, in, in the world of learning and development, it's a little bit further behind. I think there, um, so HR professionals, for example, have not been supported as much to think about, well, what's the best approach to get to the outcomes that we're trying to achieve? Um, and so I hope to see more innovation there soon. I think if people like me can do a better job of articulating, describing the, the value of uh, different approaches that aren't kind of like, slides and questions or whatever and make it easy to deliver those approaches then i think we will very rapidly see adoption uh, happening there and again it's already happening there are some pockets i do work with corporates quite frequently um and yeah they're up for innovation partly because they're looking for a better re return on investment in their in their money but i think yeah there will there will be certain pockets where innovation doesn't happen and i think that will be intentional i think what we'll probably see is the emergence of for example universities that uh that kind of sell themselves almost or differentiate on the fact that they take a very traditional lecture-based uh domain knowledge specific approach and then we will see other institutions which are much more innovative in the in the design of their um approaches and in the delivery and i think they're the institutions where we'll see the adoption of ai to to operate at scale um, but how long that will take, who knows? I mean, one thing we know about education is that it is just like refused over the past, I don't know, thousand years, ever since it ever existed as a concept, really to be disrupted. So maybe it will just go steadfast and invest in uh, technologies to to block uh, AI and this kind of emerging uh, innovation and just never change. But I don't see that happening. I see this as more of like a printing press moment where it's almost... Uh, inevitable and required for for educators to start to think about how they can do things different and better okay i'm stay happy with your evidence 
of the that process about the the change from teaching to learning right yeah. where we are putting the focus on right it's about teach or it's about learn i think is uh, the last one so thank you phil for your time for your uh spirit for your energy uh, it's a uh, really pressure to talk with you and thank you for share with us your experience your evidence your background yeah oh thanks for the opportunity this has been great and um yeah i look forward to continuing the conversation and we can uh, we can all keep an eye on whether or not change is happening and how fast and uh yeah so thanks for the opportunity <laughs>